Okay, so in this video what we want to do is go through the um, paper three questions um, for international trade. Okay, so the very first one says country X and country Y are capable of producing both apples and bananas. Assume a two country, two product model. Okay, that's what we always do in general. But anyway, um, country Y is absolute advantage in the production of both apples and bananas and comparative advantage in the production of bananas. Okay, so that's very important. It's got absolute advantage in both, but comparative advantage in bananas. So sketch and label a diagram to illustrate um, comparative advantage between country X and country Y. Okay, so what we have to say here is the very first thing is I'm just going to draw um, um, one PPF, PPC, production possibilities curve, production possibilities frontier. And I'm going to call that country X. Now, um, the thing that I want you guys to see here, and I may adjust the camera slightly, forgive me here now, so you can see a bit clearer in a second. Okay, I hope you can see that. Right, so what we're saying here now is that, there we go, um, country X, this is the production possibilities curve for country X. Now, because country Y has an absolute advantage, Okay, country Y has an absolute advantage, again, forgive me for what I'm adjusting the camera, um, in producing both goods. That means that the PPC for country Y has to be outside. Its ability to produce both goods has to be outside the entirety of the PPC, the production possibilities curve for country X. Secondly, because it's got a comparative advantage in the production of bananas, the distance between the production possibilities curve of country Y on bananas has to be wider than the distance between the two, I mean that like country X and country Y for the bananas, has to be wider than the difference, the distance between country X and country Y for apples. So what I'm going to do now is just put down my ruler and get this as wide as possible. It really doesn't matter uh, at all in this question where you put it, okay? But as you can see, this distance here is greater than this distance here. So we've got country why and that's the que that's that question answered okay so again absolute advantage in both so therefore country y has to be outside um country x on both axes and a comparative advantage in bananas that means the distance here uh, has to be greater than the distance here okay now oh good i've got my cheat sheet ready to go okay so that's that done now um, question two, outline the reason why country X, or 1B, excuse me, outline the reason why country X should specialise in the production of apples and country Y should specialise in the production of bananas. Okay, well this is kind of something just that you have to kind of learn off once you understand what comparative advantage is. Country X should specialise in the production of apples because the opportunity cost is lower in country X for apples and because specialisation should increase output. If we increase output in both countries, right, then total output will increase. If that happens, this will increase country X's consumption possibilities, increase global efficiency and result in lower prices. So if country X specializes in apples and country Y specializes in bananas, um, total output will increase and as such, um, that means consumption can increase and um, because resources are being allocated more efficiently because those countries that are best at producing each good are producing that good, i.e. country X is producing apples and country Y is producing bananas, then with that um, happening, um, prices should be lower. Now, outline run, one reason why it might not be in a country's best interest to specialise according to the principle of comparative advantage. Well, what I've done now is I've, I've put this on another sheet. Okay, well, these are the reasons, okay, we were asked for one, I'm going to give you them all just so you can understand the theory better, and please do remember them. Okay, so the first one is unemployment. So unemployment in industries where trading partners enjoy a comparative advantage because workers are unable, or unemployment occurs in these industries because workers are unable to move to those industries where there is a comparative advantage. Okay, so what we're saying here is that, look, we've got two industries, we've got mining and we've got software engineering. Engineering. And we find that we in this country have a comparative advantage in software engineering. Fine, great, no problem. So therefore, according to this theory, we should just specialise in software engineering and as such, 
completely abandon mining because the other country is better at that than we are so they have a lower opportunity cost than we do so we should import mined goods and we should export our software engineering expertise well the problem with that is it's not easy to go from a mining job to a software engineering job okay there's a huge array and vast difference in skills education so on and so forth abilities required to do mining versus software engineering and by the way vice versa too Okay, so the thing is, unemployment would occur in the mining industry, and they're like, oh, well, the theory would suggest, oh, just get a job as a software engineer. It's like, I don't know how to do that. So, therefore, there would be structural unemployment in that sense. Now, another problem which we tend to see massively in developing countries, less developed, less economically developed countries, is this idea of over-specialization. If you specialise in the export of one good, and that's what this theory is talking about, you produce only one good, you, you consume it at home and you export the rest abroad, and then you import what you don't produce. Well, therefore, that's over-specialisation. You find that modern economies, advanced economies, don't do that. This can result in vulnerabilities to change it in mar changes in market conditions or as a barrier to economic development. Now, why? Well, what you find is, particularly in primary commodities, um, that the, the price changes are incredibly volatile. So if, you know, like what's happening now is that there's an oil war essentially going on between Russia and Saudi Arabia. And therefore, I think the price of oil has dropped more than it has in the last hundred years, something like that. So if, you know, that means the value of their exports, what their entire economy in, in Saudi Arabia is based on, and they are trying to diversify away from this, but currently what it's based on, well, the amount of money that they're getting now has dropped nearly half. So what you were getting $100 for, you're now getting $50 for the exact same good. That is a problem, okay? Because if that's all you're doing, over-specialization, um, you're very vulnerable to changes in prices. Another one is national security. Risk can be reduced. Um, by the avoidance of over-reliance on trading partners for essential products or resources which might compromise national security or diminish negotiating power. So if we have a situation where we have an army and that's run, I suppose, massively on the power it gets us from petrol and we're importing our petrol, well, if we go to war, God forbid, but if we do, um, we're going to be reliant on our trading partners. And that isn't a good thing, seeing, particularly if it's possible that we've gone to war with our trading partners. Okay, so they're not going to supply us with oil anymore and therefore we're at a national security risk. Specialization. Specialization may make it difficult for the economy to diversify, protect ourselves against over specialization, protect ourselves against national security risk, and um, thus maintaining risk of vulnerability to market conditions. What I mean by market conditions is changes in prices. Okay, That's what I mean by uh, vulnerability to market conditions. Now, the next one is standards. Safety and environmental standards may be compromised by low quality imports. True, fine, I'm just gonna move on, okay? Not always true, but anyway, you have the choice to buy it or not. But still, it's, 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 it's a relevant, uh, acceptable point in the IB. If we specialize, we're assuming that we have free trade. What if we don't? What if you know the, our, our trading partners are engaging in tariffs, quotas, subsidizing domestic production in their own countries, etc.? Well, then we can't realize these gains from trade. So specialization may not result in beneficial trade if export markets are protected by barriers to trade. And that's 100% true. Okay, the last two. Um, drop in demand for exports. Again, what we are talking about is over-specialization, which is essentially what this um, model um, suggests we should do. All right, and <coughs> if the one good that we export, Grant, that is an oversimplification, but if the one good that we export and there's a drop in the demand for it, well then our economy is massively uh, susceptible to huge falls in real GDP because we only produce what we can um, sell as producers and make a profit from. And if there's a drop in demand for it, well then we're going to stop producing it and then we don't produce anything else. All right, so demand or drop in demand for exports. If if there is a reduction um, in the world demand for exported goods in the long run, this would reduce the country's terms of trade. More on that later in the course, and may harm the economy. And finally, YED income elasticity of demand. Over specialization may result in an economy continuing to produce with low YED, causing economic growth to slow relative to other countries. Okay, so they're the ones now, just trying to get myself sorted here, they're the ones that answer question 1C. 
Now, where am I now? Excellent. I'm on question 1D. Right. Now, so what we've got here is that we've got a demand and supply um, of oranges, okay? So the domestic demand and supply for oranges are given by the functions QD equals that, QS equals that, where P is the price of oranges, dollars per kilogram, QD, quantity of oranges demanded, 1,000 kilograms per month, QS, the quantity of oranges supplied, 1,000 kilograms per month. The world price of oranges is $2 per kilogram. Due to increased awareness of the possible health benefits of vitamin C, uh, the demand for oranges in country Z increases by 60,000 units per month at each price okay now let's have a look at the question I actually might alter my camera again just so I can give you guys a greater view okay so it says calculate the change in expenditure on imported oranges as a result of the increase in demand well look what I'm actually going to do now is adjust my camera again um, but what I'm actually going to do now is try to find my pencil, which is here, find my ruler, which is here, and say, okay, draw the new demand curve. Now, what we really want to do is we want to find a point on the demand curve where two grid lines cross. So essentially, you're looking for three crosses here. So if we look at this point here, right, and this is at 40,000, right, and each time I move across one box, that's 10,000. So I have to move across 60,000. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's one point on the new demand curve. And then here's another one where two grid lines cross that are simultaneously on the demand curve, right? So if I go across one, two, three, four, five, six. Right, now what I'm gonna do is very, very carefully, as carefully as possible, and I keep making this mistake, so please don't do as I say, not as I do, right? Which is to, um, don't make your points that are, like I've made here really, really big. Try and make them kind of small, okay? Um, the points that there, because it'll give you a greater opportunity of a more accurate diagram. Now, I hope you can see that. So what I did was just shift the diagram out 60,000 uh, units at each price. So it says now, calculate the change in expenditure um, on imported oranges on imported oranges as a result well you see we need to know the price now we were told that the price here is two dollars per kilogram so what i'm going to do now is what i'm currently doing now is writing or drawing more accurately i'm not writing it i'm drawing it the supply curve um at the world price at two dollars so that's world supply all right so now what we have to realize is well where does the supply curve cross the price? So this is the quantity that I'm going down now, and I'm going to take my time, as you should also. I'm going to go down here and say this is the domestic supply, because it's where the world price touches the supply curve. And that's at 60,000, but I'm just going to write that as 60. Now, originally, okay, what we had was... Um, this was the quantity demanded, which was 100,000. And now, because of the increase, this is where the new demand curve touches the world supply. Um, this is the new quantity demanded here. Okay, and that's 160,000, 160. Okay, so obviously the imports were the difference between 60 and 100, and that's 40,000. And now they're the difference between 60 and 160, which is uh, 100,000. Now, I'm going to need this again, so I shall refer to that, but, um, yeah, so now what we have to do is calculate the change in um, the amount of money spent on imports. So what I'm going to do is, I always, 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 when you're calculating change, do the new first, okay, new, and then old, okay? That's what we're gonna do. Always do new, then old. So the first thing was, right, we had to calculate the, the amount of imports, which we've already said here. So the amount of imports for the new is 160 minus 60,000, which is 100,000. But I'm just gonna write this out here. So we have 160, one, two, three, minus one, or minus 60, excuse me, uh, thousand. So that equals 100,000. And that's the imports, okay? Imports after the change in demand. So then what we do is we go 100,000, but what's the expenditure? Well, it's the price per good times the number of imports. So we bought 100,000 imports, excuse me, for um, $2 each. So now the total import expenditure is $200,000, okay? And that's the import 
expenditure. Okay, now, uh, I'm not going to do anything with that yet, so don't forget, now back to the, the graph here, okay, so what we had was the old amount of imports was 100,000 because that was the demand and um, 60,000 were produced domestically, so the difference of 40,000 must be made up by imports. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to write down uh, 100,000 minus 60,000 and that equals 40,000. Okay, and that's the imports. Okay, and then the expenditure on imports is 40,000 times two because we spend two dollars. I'll put in the dollar symbol two dollars each unit. So that's eighty thousand dollars. Now when you're finding a change it's always new minus old. Okay, so the change delta import expenditure okay the change in import expenditure equals the new which is two hundred thousand minus the old which is eighty thousand. So therefore our answer okay equals a hundred and twenty Okay, the next one is calculate the change in consumer surplus in country Z as a result of the increase in demand for oranges. Now, what we are saying here, and again, don't forget guys, new minus old, okay? So what we're saying here is this. Before the change in demand, this was the consumer surplus. This whole area here. Consumer surplus is the area below the demand curve but above the price. And this here is a triangle. This area is the consumer surplus. And how do you find the area of a triangle? Well, it's half the base times the height. So if I choose this as the base, so I have to say it's half. Well, it's not 3 and it's not 2. It's 3 minus 2. So it's half of 1 times the height, which is the quantity, which is 100,000. The new consumer surplus now is a bigger um, um, uh, triangle. But again, it's a triangle nonetheless. Okay, so please don't forget that. Right, now this here is 3.6. 3.6. Okay, so what we're saying now is it's the area of this triangle. So it's half of this. So it's 3.6 minus 2. That means this base is 1.6 units long and the height of it is 160,000. So don't forget new minus old, new minus old, that'll give you the change. Okay, so the new one, I'll put this up here. Okay, so new. Okay, so the first one, it's half the base, which is 3 minus 2. I'll show you all these figures. Sorry, 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 3.6. I'm doing stupid stuff here. Times 160,000. This is the new one. Okay, so again, where did I get these figures from? Okay, we're doing the new one, all right? So it's 3.6 minus 2. There's the figures. And then it's 160,000. That's the height. Okay, so it's a half the base times the height. So that means it's half. 3.6 minus 2 is 1.6 times 160,000. Okay, half 3.6 is 0 0.8 times 160,000. And then uh, 0 0.8, I'm checking my ch cheat sheet here. I'm not doing this in my head, don't worry, is 128. 0 0.8 times 160 is 128,000. So that's the new consumer surplus. The old consumer surplus is half 3 minus 2 times 100,000. And I'll show you where I get these figures now again. Okay, so it's half 3 minus 2 times 100,000, which is 3 minus 2, that's the base, and then the 100,000 is out to here, and that's the height of the triangle. Okay, so I'm going to try and speed up a bit if I can, guys. Okay, so 3 minus 2 is 1 times 100,000. 1 times a half is 0 0.5 times 100,000. Okay, and then we've got 50,000. Do not forget consumer surplus is always, and producer surplus is always in dollars. So the change, therefore, okay, in consumer surplus equals new minus old, 128, 1, 2, 3, minus 50. One, two, three, which equals, or our answer equals $78,000. Okay, absolutely amazing. Now, very, very quickly. Okay, so calculate the change in social community, or community surplus. Excuse me, guys, I'm going to take a drink here. Mm. So calculate the change in community surplus, also known as social surplus, also known as total surplus total welfare, um, all of these words, just get used to changing them and, and using them interchangeably, okay? Well, what can, uh, I'll call it total surplus if you'll allow me. Okay, what total surplus is, or community surplus is, um, producer surplus 
plus consumer surplus. So if there is a change, that means either and or a consumer surplus must have changed and or producer surplus must have changed. But the change in producer surplus is zero and the reason is because we're importing the rest, okay? So the producer surplus is this triangle here, the area measured in currency in this triangle here, okay? Always measured in currency. If I said dollars before, I apologize. Right, so um, that didn't change. So um, the change in total surplus is 78,000, which we've just calculated up here, plus zero, which is 78,000. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, excellent, we're moving on, we're moving on. All right, now just fixing my sheets here. Okay, state one administrative barrier to trade that Country Z could use in order to restrict imports. I annoy myself when I do that, guys, so you must be very annoyed when I don't have it on the camera. An administrative barrier is a barrier to trade that isn't one of the traditional ones. It, and I keep on saying this, it's bureaucracy. It's a way to reduce imports without implementing a quota, a tariff, a subsidy or um, foreign exchange controls. Okay, so one administrative barrier, of course, I'm going to give you all of them. Requirements for packaging and labeling. Well, um, you know, if, we, if you have say that uh, I gave the example, so I'm currently in Mongolia, and I gave the example that um, there's a, a Korean shop here called Emart. And if the Mongolian government um, said that, um, oh, every single bit of packaging has to be written in Cyrillic, which is the, the alphabet that's used in Mongolia currently, um, every bit of al uh, packaging has to be written in Cyrillic, well then the Emart shop would have to change all of their packaging to Cyrillic. That's expensive. That a increase in cost is going to have to be passed on to the consumer in terms of higher prices. That increase in price is going to make these goods less competitive and as such essentially is a barrier to trade but it's an administrative one. Health and safety inspection procedures, well if everything that is imported is required to be um, inspected for health and safety that costs money. The importing company is the one that's going to have to pay that um, money. Then that means their cost of production increases, that means that the price increases, that makes these imported goods less competitive um, and as such as a barrier to trade. Changes in permitted um, specifications for a product. If they actually have to change a product, that literally means they may have to go back to the drawing board with R&D if it's something like a car or something like that. That's it's insanely expensive. It's just removing any type of comparative advantage and as such protecting domestic industries, a barrier to trade. An increased bureaucracy it could be like, yeah, there's no barriers to trade here, absolutely fantastic, except for every single good that you import you have to fill out 2,000 forms. I mean, you know, that's also going to reduce, increase costs, reduce any um, 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 uh, comparative advantage and as such is in itself a barrier to trade. Now, define the term social or community surplus. Well, as, I, as I've already said, the sum of producer and consumer surplus enjoyed, the sum of producer and, uh, and consumer surplus um, experience, whatever you want, okay? Now, um, I'll come back to that actually in a second. Well, actually, I won't, Ned, because while we're on it, I might as well do it. I don't really mind how long this video goes on for, and I promise you it's going to be a long one, okay? So given domestic demand and supply, we reach a allocative efficient, allocatively efficient market equilibrium at a price of 10 and a quantity which I believe is 50,000 units. And I am right to believe that. Okay, so that's 50, right? So what we're saying here is that this area here, the area below the demand curve and above the price is consumer surplus. This area here, the area above the supply curve and below the price is producer surplus. This whole triangle here is um, what we in the game like to call total surplus. And that's the addition of the two, which is that question there. Okay, now, am I right to move on? At least for the moment, I am. Now, calculate uh, the social community, the total surplus in the market for cotton in San Marcos. Well, lovely, right? So the first thing that we have to do, and this is a bit of experience, guys, a bit of advice. Invariably in these questions, they're going to ask you for the change in producer surplus or the change in consumer surplus. So you're like, okay, John, why are you saying that? Well, what I'm talking about here is you could just work out this entire area here. No problem. Absolutely no problem. But my advice is always to split it up for these questions, right? Because you want to split it up into consumer surplus and producer surplus because they're going to change something. All right. So Consumer surplus is this area here, so if this is the base, 
Well, how long is the base? Is it 20? No, it's not, because 20 is the distance from here to here. Well, how long is this base? Well, the area below the demand curve and above the price. So if this is 20 and this is 10, I have to take 10 away from 20. And then this is the height, which is 50. But don't forget, it's half the base times the height. So if I just kind of go through, and I hope you guys get that now. So it's, and I'm going to try and keep it straight here. So 0 0.5, I'll move my body, 20 minus 10 times 50,000, and it was 50,000, okay? 0 0.5, this is the area of that triangle which represents consumer surplus. Okay, so we've got five times 50, one, two, three. Don't forget, consumer surplus and producer surplus is always in currency, which is 250,000. Okay, lovely. Now, let's go back for a producer surplus. It's the area of this triangle here. If I'm saying this is the base, Okay, well, how long is the base? Well, 10 minus 4 long. If I'm saying this is the height, how, long, how high is the height? Well, 50,000, but it's half the base times the height. Okay, so what we've got is 0 0.5 times 10 minus 4 times 50,000. Okay, 0 0.5 times 6 times 50. We've got 3 times 50,000. And again, guys, producer and consumer surplus is always in dollars or any form of currency. I shouldn't say dollars, but I should say currency. What I will say here now, total community surplus equals 250,000, 250,000, plus 150,000, 1, Five zero one two three. So our answer, therefore, equals they are added together. I always have to check four hundred thousand. Okay. Okay, absolutely fantastic. Now, the government in San Marcos decides to provide a subsidy equal to $8 per kilogram, $8 per good, essentially, as we're measuring it here, to the producers of cotton. Draw and label the new supply curve for granting the subsidy to domestic cotton producers. Okay, so it's $8 per kilogram. Now, again, what do we do, right? So what we actually need here is to go to a point. So first of all, it's the supply curve because it's a subsidy. That's the very first thing that's affected. And the supply curve is going to shift outwards and downwards, all right? Um, now, we need to go to a point that is on the supply curve and also where two grid lines cross. Now, I see one here. So I'm going to look at that and just see what price that, that's 16. So now we need to go down to eight, which is here. And that's that point there. Now let's see if I can follow my own advice and make a smaller dot. Okay, maybe. Okay, and then it's gonna reduce it outwards because more is gonna be produced because of the subsidy. And this was also here. So I'm gonna go down to two here and say, that's it. Now you can't really see that, but still, I think we know it's there. Okay, you join up these and try to be as careful as you can. And that's why I'm taking my time, even though I'm sure it's annoying. Okay, and these lines, so supply plus sub, these lines should be parallel. And I think mm, within a reasonable amount they are. Okay, now, what am I doing? So I've drawn that, I've done that, so that's that, right? Calculate the cost to the government of San Marcos of providing this subsidy to cotton producers. Well, I will kind of show this here. The cost of the subsidy equals subsidy per unit times the quantity supplied. So we need to work out the quantity supplied now with the new subsidy. So we see where the two lines cross. This is the new supply curve. This is the demand curve that hasn't changed. All right, and we say, okay, the two lines cross here, and I think that is 60, 65, 70, 75. That is 75,000 units. Now, what's the price of this, right? Well, just making sure, just making sure. Um, the price, again, is from the intersection of the two. And uh, taking my time, and that's $5 per kilogram. Okay, so the thing is, for every kilogram that is produced in this market by these domestic producers, the government's going to pay them $8. Well, that's fantastic. Okay, so subsidy per unit is $8. We got that in the question. Multiplied by the quantity supplied, which is 75,000 units. 
Okay, well, that answer, just working it out on your calculator, is $600,000. That's the cost to the government of providing this subsidy to the producers in San Marcos. Now, okay, the next question is here. I'm going to keep this high so you guys can see it. Calculate the resulting change in producer surplus following the introduction of the subsidy. Now, this here is very important. Okay, first thing I'm going to write is new producer surplus okay and then i'm going to write old producer surplus okay now we need to get the diagram back this confuses people this confuses people the reason that this confuses people is because we're dealing with this here i know that this is the new supply curve but it's not, it is and it isn't. God, that's terrible teaching, right? This is the new supply curve. But what they actually receive is the price of that the consumer pays them plus $8. So the amount that they receive per good sold is got by going up from the equilibrium to the old supply curve. Okay, please don't forget that because that's the amount that they receive. So they're getting $5 off the consumer. Yeah, nobody's disputing that. Okay, but they're also getting $8 off the government. So the total amount that they get, and we're reading this off the graph, is 13. But if you add 5 and 8, you get 13. Okay, so what we're saying here now is that um, it's the area above the supply curve and below the price. So in terms of producer surplus, we're measuring it off the old supply curve. But this is the real reward that they're receiving. Essentially, this is the real price. And this is where the old supply curve starts. So we're measuring this area here because they are receiving $13 per good. Please don't forget that. This is the effect of supply on the market, but this is the amount that they receive. So when we're talking about the firms, we're back to the old supply curve. Okay, so the length of this line is 13 minus four because it touches in here four, and the height of it is all the way out to 75,000. So, uh, just trying to keep everything in line. So, the new producer surplus is 0 0.5 times 13 minus four times 75,000, which is 0 0.5 times nine times 75,000, which is 4.5 times 75,000 which equals, and I'm just checking my sheets here, 337,500. Okay, now the old producer surplus, okay, was this area here, okay, because they were getting 10, it's still the old supply curve, and it's this area here, and the height of it is 50. Okay, so it's half 10 minus 4 times 50,000. Right, so it's 0 0.5 times 10 minus 4 times 50,000. So it's 0 0.5 times 6 times 50,000, which is 3 times 50,000, which is 150,000 currency is dollars. So therefore, the change in producer surplus, and please guys remember this, new minus old, it's the perfect way to um, measure the change in anything, okay? Because if, if it's... Um, if, if the answer turns out to be a minus, which obviously in this case it hasn't, excuse me, but if the answer turns out to be a minus, um, that means it has fallen. So it's just easier to see. 187,500. Okay, great. Now it says calculate the change in consumer surplus resulting from the subsidy. Now what you have to realize is that the, everybody's paying for this subsidy. But what the consumer surplus was, was the area below the demand curve and above the old price. Now, the change in consumer surplus is all of this. So there's been a big increase in consumer surplus, but it is not free because it is paid for out of taxes. So we have the new consumer surplus. I'll just set up this. So we've got 0 0.5 times 20 minus 5. I'll show you where I'm getting all of this from. Times 75,000. Okay, so it's the area. The new one is the big one. So it's 20. It's the area below the demand curve and above the price. So it's this area here. So it's half 20 minus 5 times 75,000. Okay, that's the new one. So it's 0 0.5 times 15 times 75,000, which is 7.5 
times 75,000. Now, I will have to check the sheet here, which is, my God, it's a horrible number, 562,500. Not that bad, I suppose. That's the new one. This is the old one, old consumer surplus here. Okay, so we've got 0 0.5 times 20 minus 10 times 50,000. Where am I getting these numbers from? Okay, 20 minus 10 is the base, and this is the height, which is 50,000. Okay, so it's 0 0.5 times 10 times 50,000, which is 5 times 50,000, which is again in currency 250,000. Consumer surplus, producer surplus, always in currency. Okay, so what we have is the new minus the old. And our answer equals 300, and it's an increase because it's a positive 312,500. Okay, excellent. Now, what am I on to now? Okay, what's this? This is 2 A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, I don't want to make any silly mistakes, so 2G. Okay, explain two reasons why Government of San Marcos may have decided to grant a subsidy for cotton producers. Okay, 2G is here. All right, so the first one is, you, you, you want to think they're always trying to, any type of trade protection, any type of subsidy, any, any interference in the market in general, if there's no externalities involved, a lot of the time, um, you know, a subsidy is always to protect the producers. Okay, so to assist cotton producers. A subsidy helps cotton producers as the price per unit earned following a subsidy increases. Also, the amount produced and sold will be greater. Therefore, both of these lead to higher revenues for cotton producers. Please keep that in mind. Two benefits, a higher price in terms of the lower market price, but the increase in subsidy and also increase in revenues from greater sales. So both of those cause, cause uh, total revenue to rise. To assist the textile industry, cotton is an input into the textile industry. So, uh, subsidizing cotton reduces the cost of production, making textiles cheaper and increasing profitability there. So there's a knock-on effect. To reduce unemployment, well, we've already seen that more is produced both in the cotton industry and the textile industry. So therefore, how are they going to produce that with more factors of production? What's one uh, factor of production is employment. Uh, labour. A subsidy increases output in the cotton and textile industry. In order to increase this output, more workers will be required, thus causing unemployment to fall. Another one is net exports. Okay, So what a subsidy does is reduces the cost of production. All right? That's what a subsidy does. And in reducing the cost of production, it reduces the price of that good. So this lower price may cause exports to increase and imports of cotton to decrease as a result of making cotton produced in San Marcos more competitive on the international market. And the final thing, to assist the buyers of cotton. I mean, we've shown this already that they'd be better off if they just kept the money. But the cotton subsidy will decrease the cost of production of cotton, thus increasing supply, which causes the price to decrease. If people are paying, a lo if consumers are paying a lower price for cotton, that means that, um, you know, um, in a sense, they're richer in real terms, but don't forget they're poorer because of the taxes that they have to pay to fund it. Okay, state two functions of the World Trade Organization. Well, it promotes trade liberalization, wants freer trade, sets trade rules, says no dumping on international markets and stuff like that. Ensures that trade rules are adhered to. Hey, you stop doing that. Um, America recently took um, the EU to court for subsidizing Airbus, a French uh, airplane manufacturer, and they won. And when I say court, to the WTO, and the WTO ruled in their favor. Settle trade related disputes, settles, excuse me, and um, provides trade related technical assistance and provides a forum for trade negotiation. I'm trying to still, you know, just pick up the pace a little bit. Plot and label the world cotton supply curve uh, that's, uh, oh, sorry, um, the world price for cotton is $2 per kilogram. The WTO permits the government of San Marcos to maintain an $8 subsidy. All right. You'd be doing something very well without knowing what you were plotting. Okay, so now it says plot the world supply curve. Absolutely fantastic, okay? So what we've got here is we take out our, my trusty ruler and pencil. I do believe it was at two. I could be wrong, but I think it was. I shouldn't do this. Don't do what I'm doing in the exam. Okay, and we're at two there. Yes, okay, the world price forgotten is two. Right, so plot that. Well, I've done that, okay? There's the world supply curve now. Okay, 
Now, let's move on. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Okay. Forgive me, guys. I'm just trying to stay um, on top of everything. Now, okay. With reference to your answer, and, well, don't worry. That's a different one. Calculate the change in the cost of financing the $8 per kilogram subsidy to the government of San Marcos. Now, what we're saying here is thus. Um, um, right. The old subsidy was 600000 We had already worked that out. The new subsidy now is $8 per good produced. But now, if we look here, and I will show this, and I know it's getting cluttered, and I'm sorry, guys, I'll do this here. This is the quantity demanded, and this here, this 50,000, is the quantity supplied domestically, okay? Because this is where the new supply curve crosses the world supply. So now the government is paying $8 per kilogram to 50,000 goods because we are producing domestically 50,000 goods. Now, so that's what I've got written here. So then the new subsidy cost, and that's 400,000. Okay, so the change in the subsidy cost, okay, equals new minus old, which is 400,000 minus 600,000. Have I done that right? Yes, I have. And so therefore, our change in subsidy equals minus. 200, sorry, 200,000, okay? That's a decrease, so please keep that in mind, okay? That's a decrease. Explain one possible advantage and one possible disadvantage for San Marcos uh, economy. Remember, it asks for the economy of the decision to join the WTO and slowly liberalize trade. Well, let me find this one, because this one is 2K, okay, 2K. Right, the advantages. Okay, cheaper consumer prices, absolutely, no disputing that. Okay, they, you, you wouldn't import them unless they were cheaper. So since tariffs and other trade restrictions will be removed, consumers will enjoy cheaper and a greater variety of imports. Cheaper production costs. Uh, since tariffs and other trade restrictions will be removed, production costs for firms, for domestic firms, using imported inputs will be lower. Remember that, sometimes we get lower prices because of cheaper inputs. Increased exports. Domestic firms will have easier access to foreign markets, increasing their exports, and then lower average costs. So domestic firms that grow, what they may do is they may face a reduction in average costs. Okay, lower average costs as a result of increased, oh, excuse me, increased economies of scale as a result of greater levels of production. Now that just means that there's lower average costs, and that may also help the price domestically as well. The disadvantage, now it may, not necessarily, disadvantages, all, um, over specialization. Over specialization may render the economy vulnerable to changes in prices of imports and exports. Remember that, guys, that's what we're talking about. It did say market conditions in the previous one. I don't really like that, but that's what it said in the uh, market team. Just write down vulnerable to price changes of exports and imports, okay? Lack of competitiveness. Domestic industries unable to compete with foreign producers may suffer job losses. The mining versus the um, software engineering example. New industries. It may be harder to establish new industries due to competitive advantage or comparative advantages, in, in fact, of foreign producers. Okay, both is true. Um, but that's true too, okay? Like, you might have a guy say, oh, I think I'm setting up this firm. It's, oh, no, we can import it for cheaper. Oh, flip. Okay, and then loss of tariff revenue. There is a loss to the government of tariff revenues which could have been used for public investment in schools, hospitals, whatever you want yourself. Okay, all of these things, absolutely, um, at least reasonably true. Now, on to this one. Okay, so on to question three. Now, first things first. Okay, there's country A and country B. Without reading anything, without knowing anything, you should know straight away the country A has an absolute advantage in both goods. Why? Because its PPC, its production possibility curve, is to the right of on both axes of country B. Also, you should know that it has a comparative advantage in bananas. Straight away you should know. Okay, because the distance here is greater than the distance here. So that means that country B has a comparative advantage in the production of cotton. Okay, using the diagram, calculate the opportunity cost of producing one ton of bananas in country A. Well, opportunity cost, other goes over. So it's cotton over bananas. So we're talking about country A, so it's 300 because cotton is on the top because the opportunity cost of bananas, the other goes over. So cotton's on the top, bananas on the bottom. So it's 300 over 800, which equals... Uh, 3 over 8 
or if you want, um, sorry, what's that? Uh, yeah, 0 0.375, 0 0.375 tons of cotton. T O N N E S of cotton. Okay, excellent. That's our answer there. Now, on to the next one. Um, using information provided in the diagram to support your answer, determine which country should specialize in the production of cotton. Well, like we've already seen that, but um, um, we can talk why. Okay, so we've said country A. Okay, bananas equals three over eight tons of cotton. Country B, and I mean the opportunity cost. Country B, the opportunity cost of bananas is cotton divided by bananas. So that's 200 divided by 200, which is one ton. So therefore, uh, country A gives up less in terms of the production of cotton when they produce bananas and as such should specialize in the production of bananas. Country A should specialize in the production of bananas and country B should specialize in the production of cotton. That's all you need. Distinguish between the terms absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Well, that's no problem. Okay, so absolute advantage means that one country can produce more of a product than another country with the same amount of resources. Brilliant. So given the same workers, all that kind of stuff, uh, land, uh, they can produce more. There's probably climactic conditions for that kind of stuff, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, um, comparative advantage means that the opportunity cost of producing a good is lower for one country than another. Okay, now, question 3D, which is on the sheet. Explain two reasons why specialization in a narrow range of primary products, according to the theory of comparative advantage, might not benefit a less economically developed country. Okay. Again, these are all very simplistic. Over-specialization. Specialization, according to comparative advantage, may lead to over-specialization, which would make the economy vulnerable to changes in the prices of imports and exports. Absolutely true. Over-reliance on in inelastic exports. Specialization may lead um, the... Um, or may result in the economy relying on the export of primary commodities, which may be income inelastic and therefore unlikely to lead to sustained growth. And that's because as you spend more, um, um, which I think I talk about later, do I? But as you spend more total revenue, uh, yeah, I will talk about that later. Access to markets. It may not be possible for less economically developed countries, LEDCs, to gain access to international markets as a result of trade barriers or trade protection. And therefore, you know, it's not going to benefit them. Uh, volatile prices, as we've already said. See, all of these are repeating. Primary products are often subject to supply shocks, resulting in volatile prices and difficulty or an unwillingness to plan ahead. The government or industry are not willing to change their minds about what they do or try to diversify, which they really should. And price inelastic demand. Demand for primary products may be price inelastic, which leads to falling revenue when output is increased. As you increase output, will you have to lower the price? Okay, and the percentage change in quantity demand is less than the percentage change in price. That's the definition of an, um, a good that is currently inelastic. All right, now, am I good? Yes, I'm moving on. Okay, forgive me, guys. The bell might go off in, um, in uh, about 20 minutes or so, so forgive me for that. I'm just conscious of it. The following diagram in, um, illustrates domestic market for rice in country alpha. Okay, calculate the social surplus at the equilibrium market price. Right, that's the first question. Now, where am I getting these? I'm not going to spend too much time on this, okay? But what I will spend a little bit of time on is um, drawing in the um, equilibrium price and quantity and then um, separating the total surplus or the community surplus out into uh, producer and consumer surplus. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, so what we've got is here's the equilibrium. And what is this? 8,000 kilograms per year. Lovely. Okay, so therefore, the consumer surplus is this area here. It's the area of a triangle. What is the formula for area of a triangle? Here's consumer surplus. And I'm going to have to be economical with my space here. Okay, it's half the base times the height. So it's 0 0.5 times 14 minus 6, 14 minus 6 times 8,000. Okay, which is 0 0.5 times 14 minus 6 is 8, times 8,000, which is 4 times 8,000, which is 32,000 what? Dollars. Okay, please remember that. Okay, that's the com uh, consumer surplus. Producer surplus is 6 minus 2, but it's not that, it's a oh flip, a half 
6 minus 2 times 8,000, which is a half 4 times 8,000, which is 2 times 8,000, which is $16,000, okay? And therefore, the social surplus equals consumer surplus plus producer surplus. So the social surplus, SS here, equals 32 plus 16,000, which equals in total 48,000. And remember allocative efficiency. What allocative efficiency means is that this is the way where demand and supply are equal. That is the way to maximize total revenue. Okay, the perfect amount from society's point of view, given our uh, limited resources and our current preferences. Demand is preferences, supply is limited resources. This is the perfect amount of this good to produce um, in society. Okay, now it says the government in Alpha imposes a um, price ceiling of five dollars per kilogram right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use to try and make this slightly more evident i'm going to use my blue pen here okay and i'm going to go across price ceiling never a fan of it never a fan of it okay five dollars per kilogram all right so the quantity demanded is nine thousand but the quantity supplied seems to be six thousand okay so qs and QD, okay? So the shortage is QD minus QS. Well, QD is 9,000 units, and QS is 6,000 units, which equals uh, 3,000 units, or kilograms, or whatever. Okay? Now, that's the shortage. Now, what am I on to now? I'm on to 4C, excellent, okay. Next one. The government in Alpha imposes a price ceiling of $5 per kilogram. Calculate the change um, in consumer surplus after the imposition of this price ceiling. Now, this is actually really important because don't forget this. Now, this is the quantity supplied, right? And people are like, oh, it's, it's all the way down to here. Well, it's not because we can only consume what we produce or import, right? And therefore, so the consumer surplus is this, the new consumer surplus is this unusual area here. So I'm going to split that up into two separate diagrams, essentially. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make this into a triangle and then a rectangle here, okay? So the triangle is 14 minus 8, okay? So it's half 14 minus 8, okay? So it's 0.5. 14 minus 8 times 6,000. That was the quantity supplied, and we can't demand any more than that unless we import it. 0 0.5 times 6 times 6,000. Excuse me. Okay, which is 3 times 6,000, which is $18,000. Okay, and then we've also got the area of the rectangle which is this area here. So it's eight minus five times 6,000, okay? Now it's not a half, okay? Eight minus five times 6,000, okay? Which is three, excuse me, times 6,000, which is also 18,000, um, which equals uh, 18, one, two, three dollars. So therefore, uh, the, yeah, sorry, I, I have to add these. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So it's this plus this added together, which is 32 to, or 36, silly me. Okay. And the reason why we calculated the um, consumer surplus this way, okay, because if we look at this, all right, it's um, the consumer surplus is, uh, where are we, 32. Yeah, absolutely. The consumer surplus here, excuse me, is 32. Okay, so what we're saying here now, it's old minus new. So it's 36 minus 32 equals 4,000 increase. Okay, so that's the change there. So the government and alpha, we know that. Calculate the welfare laws after the imposition of the price ceiling. Okay, well, what we've got here is there's a few ways to do this. We've got the total welfare previously, or the total surplus is 48,000. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, like always, new minus old. Okay, so we've already calculated that the uh, new total welfare or consumer uh, surplus is uh, new consumer surplus equals uh, 36,000. Okay, so now we have to calculate the new producer surplus. And that equals 0 0.5, I'll explain where I'm getting these numbers from in a second, 5 minus 2 times 6,000. Okay, where am I getting the 5 minus 2? Well, it's a 5 minus 2 to here, this triangle area here, all right, times 6,000, which equals 0 0.5 times 3 times 6,000, uh, which equals 0 0.5, or sorry, 1.5 times 6,000, which equals 9,000. Right, so the new pr total surplus, like new total surplus, equals thirty six thousand plus nine thousand, which equals forty five thousand. Okay, so it's always new minus old, so it's forty five thousand minus forty eight thousand equals minus three thousand. Dollars, and that's the reduction in total surplus. Okay, now um, the next one that we have here is. Um, okay, forgive me, guys. I had to pause the video there. So, um, um, I think we finished up on forty-five thousand, and therefore it was minus three thousand. So there was a reduction. Okay, now so a new government in Alpha decides to abolish the price ceiling. Instead, it opens the rice market to imports. The world supply of rice is perfectly elastic. Any quantity can be bought for three dollars per kilogram. Using the diagram, calculate the import expenditures. Right. So three dollars per kilogram is the amount uh, is the price at the world price. Okay, so we're going to do this. Okay, so this is supply world. All right, and now we're saying I think it's I've even forgotten the question, but I know what I'm doing. Okay, so now it's saying I think it's calculate the expenditure on imports. So we're consuming eleven. Producing two, so that's 11 minus two is nine. Okay, so it's 9,000. So to calculate the expenditure on imports, okay, what we're doing here is um, 11,000 minus 2,000 times three dollars, okay, which is 9,000 times three dollars, which is 27,000. Okay, fantastic. All right, so now the next one is define the term uh, comparative advantage. Comparative advantage means that an opportunity cost of producing a good is lower in one country than it is in another. Okay, that's what that means. Now, on to the next one here. My God, if I was organized. Um, 4G, okay, 4G. So let me find this one. Here we go. So it's explain two limitations to the theory of comparative advantage. All right, so the limitations to the theory of comparative advantage. Now you can say perfect competition is fine or perfect knowledge. So as in perfect competition, it is assumed that producers and consumers have perfect um, knowledge or information and are aware of where the least expensive goods may be purchased. Okay, that's one issue. The next one is zero transport costs. It is usually assumed, it is assumed, that there are no transport costs. However, in reality, this is not true. The existence of transport costs may erode a country's comparative advantage and make international trading not worthwhile, since it may eliminate its competitiveness. Okay, homogenous products. It is usually assumed that the goods being traded are identical, such as barley, cotton, or bananas, or rice as it was in this case. Okay. However, problems arise with goods um, such as consumer durables. A Toshiba television will be different to a Philips television, and so it is much harder to prove that Japan has a comparative advantage in pr producing televisions. Um, immobile factors of production. 
Um, it is usually assumed that the factors of production remain in the country. However, it may be the factors of production rather than the goods themselves that move from country to country. So, an example of this is developed countries, rather than exporting finished goods to less economically developed countries, may invest capital in less economically developed countries to enable goods to be produced there. So, therefore, change a comparative advantage. And labour may migrate from low-wage to high-wage countries, again, therefore changing comparative advantage. And the last one is technology is fixed. It's assumed that technology is fixed and these things don't change, and that is absolutely untrue. So let's say if America currently has a um, comparative advantage in software engineering, there's nothing to say that that won't move to Kuwait, Russia, China, Korea, anywhere in the future. There's nothing to say that that won't change because the technologies that are used may be different in the future. Okay, now on to question 4H. I said this would be a long video. I'm coming up to an hour of recording. I think it's going to be another 30 minutes. Okay, so Alpha's government decides to impose a $2 tariff on each kilogram of imported rice. Using the diagram, calculate the different revenue that, excuse me, the government revenue that results from the imposition of the tariff. So now what it's saying is it, the, the, the government is putting a $2 tariff. Do I have any colours left? I don't think I do, right? So I'm going to use... Um, at the two dollar tariff is here okay and i'm going to go back up from three we're back up to five okay back up to the um price ceiling one okay and it says now it says right so what we're saying is the quantity supplied domestically is six which is less than two and the quantity demanded is nine which is less than eleven but this whole area here forgive me i'll actually try Keep this whole area here is gov rev. Okay, so it's two dollars from nine minus six, which is three thousand goods. All right, so the um, calculation for this now is two dollars times three one two three equals six thousand. Okay, so six thousand dollars the government gets from um, charging that tariff. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, on to question five. So, the following diagram illustrates the market for bananas in country A, um, D and S represent domestic demand and supply, um, and a world price of three dollars per kilogram. Okay, now, Assuming that there is no restrictions on importing bananas in the country, state the quantity of bananas which will be purchased each month in the country. Right. Well, for whatever reason, I'm going to use my blue pen here, and I'm going to say $3. That's what it says in the question, $3 per kilogram. So I'm going to go out to $3. Okay, I'm going to write SW. Now, what is the quantity demanded? Well... Currently, at that, here's the demand curve, here's the um, international, the world supply. So that answer there is 400,000. But while I'm here, I might as well put in the QS. Okay, so QS and then QD. Okay, QD equals 400 kilograms, or is it just in, no, 400,000 kilograms, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, excuse me, so 400, but it's thousands of kilograms per month, okay? Okay, excellent. Now, on to the next one, which is 4G. Okay, and how about, make sure I have, okay, no, it's not, sorry, 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 silly me, silly me, silly me, I nearly did it again. Okay, I do apologize, 5B, okay. Now, um, assuming that there are no restrictions, yeah, uh, calculate the monthly expenditure on, ban uh, on bananas imported into the country. Right, so what we're doing here now, the monthly expenditure, so that's going to be three, I'll um, write this here, three dollars, okay, and it's 400 minus 50, which is 350,000, okay, so what we've got here now is we've got imports is 400,000 kilograms minus 50,000, because these were produced domestically, equals 350,000 kilograms 
Okay, so now we have 350,000 times $3 equals spent on imports is $1,050,000. Spent on imports is that, okay? Assuming there are no restrictions of importing bananas, calculate domestic producer surplus. Right, again, what we've got to do here, this area here, is the current domestic producer surplus. So we need to find the height, or the width, the base, and the height, okay? Well, the height as I am uh, measure it is on the quantity axis, and the base is three minus two. So the area of that triangle, okay, is the producer surplus equals 0 0.5 times three minus two times 50,000. Okay, equals 0 0.5 times 1 times 50,000. Equals 0 0.5 times 50,000, which equals $25,000. That's the producer surplus, okay? I hope that makes sense. Now, the government of country A decides to impose a quota on banana demand, banana imports, sorry, of 150,000 per month. Identify the price that will be paid by consumers in country A per kilogram of bananas. Now, this is a cracker, and I actually do like this question. I do think it's a good one, and I may use, um, I suppose, my red pen or something. I'm not sure what I'll be using, but anyway. Um, um, so, here we're at 50, right? And then this part is um, um, provided by the domestic producers. And then they're saying they're going to allow in another 150. I just want to make sure they, they said that. Or, God, I'm not reading the right one. I am, 150,000, right. So you go out 50,000, 100,000, 150,000, okay? Now, all we're doing here is shifting the part of the supply curve, which is above the world price, out by the quota. That's what we are doing, right. So what I need now, is to move something that has two grid lines on it that the supply curve goes through. So 50, 1, 150. And then I'll do this again, 50, 1, 150. Okay, so now, oh, obviously you guys use pencil in your exam. I'm just trying to make sure that um, you can see what I'm doing. Okay, and this is the supply curve with the quota, right? I don't know what I've done with this. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this is supply plus quota. All right. Now, the next thing that we have to do is find the price. Okay. Well, now the new price that everybody enjoys, including those um, uh, foreigners that are exporting to us, that represent our imports, right? This is the new price that they even receive as well. Okay. Um, and that is... Five dollars, and then what's this? Three hundred thousand, which is already written there. Okay, so if I put this back here, get my other pen. So the price then is five dollars. We got that by moving it out. Okay, now I'm on to E. Excellent. Okay, uh, identify the quantity of bananas. Well, I've already I've already done that, um, which is here at three hundred thousand. Okay, so that's an easy one to write in. Okay, 300, 1, 2, 3, and that's in kg. Okay, now, the next thing is calculate the change in revenue earned by domestic producers of bananas in country A. Right, well, the first thing is that we have to say is, excuse me, just trying to get this. Um, the first thing that we have to say is their revenue that they got was price times quantity, right? Now, so they sold 50,000, all right, and at a price of three, okay? That was before the, the quota was enacted. So it was $3 times 50,000 units equals 150, one, two, three. Now, afterwards, okay, what they've done is essentially two things, okay? So they get, they get this amount here, okay, which is five by 50,000. Don't forget this one, two, three, this whole area here represents the revenue to foreigners, okay? And then they also get this amount here. So we're trying to calculate the area of two rectangles, okay? Which is here and here, 
Okay, I hope that makes sense. So what we're doing now is thus, which is five times 50, one, two, three, plus 100, one, two, three. Now, where am I getting the 100 from? And the 100 is gotten from here, okay? Because this is where from 50 to 200 is foreign production. And then from 200 to 300 is um, domestic production again, okay? So please, please, please keep that in mind. All right, so it's five dollars now as well. So it's five dollars. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, actually, I'll write it down here, which is five times 150, okay, which equals 750. So the change in revenue, therefore, okay, it's new minus old, so it's 750 minus 150 equals 600,000. Okay, great. I hope that makes sense. Now, with reference to the diagram, explain why the welfare loss from the imposition of the quota is likely to be greater than the welfare loss resulting from a $2 tariff. Now, let's be very clear here. If we put in a tariff of $2, we'd be back up to 5 it would go along here and then we'd be there as well, okay? So the quantity and the price would be the exact same. Now this is why quotas are not a good idea in general, all right? Because the government doesn't benefit. And the reason is the welfare loss is likely to be greater for a quota, even though it would end up at the same price and the same quantity demanded. Because even though the impact on price and quantity is the same in this diagram, in this case of a $2 tariff, the government does not benefit in terms of revenue from a quota, which it would benefit if there was a tariff um, um, charged. So I think quota is genuinely one of the worst ones that you can do, one of the worst types of trade protection that can be done. Now, I hope that does make sense. I really, really do. Now, on to the next question. We've got a few more. We're still going. One hour and ten minutes. Okay. The following table shows the amount of wheat and rice which could be produced in country A and country B with given quantity of labour. Assume that wheat uh, and rice are the only two products produced in these countries and that labour is the only resource necessary. From the data provided, calculate the opportunity cost of producing each kilogram of wheat in country A. Well, it's opportunity cost means other goes over. So that means it's rice on top of wheat because the rice is 80 and the wheat is 100, which equals 0 0.8. What that means is the answer equals the opportunity cost, okay, of wheat in country A equals 0 0.8 kilograms of rice. That's what they give up in terms of rice in order to produce wheat. Okay. Um, the opportunity cost in country A of producing a kilogram of rice. Well, again, the other goes over. It's wheat divided by rice. And, and wheat, excuse me, guys, and wheat is 100 and rice is 80. So what that is, is 1.25. So the answer, uh, opportunity cost of rice in country A equals 1.25 kilograms uh, of wheat. Okay, no problem. The next one here is, uh, what's this? Opportunity cost producing a kilogram of wheat in country B. Well, again, other goes over. So it's rice divided by wheat in country B. So it's 100 divided by 200, right? So equals 100 divided by 200 equals 0 0.5. Okay, so the answer is the opportunity cost of wheat in country B equals 0 0.5 kilograms of rice. Now, let's have a look. What was, yeah, so the opportunity cost of wheat in country A was 0 0.8. So straight away, country B has a, a comparative advantage in um, wheat. Okay, isn't that right? Yes. Okay, and then from the data provided, calculate the opportunity cost of producing a kilogram of rice. Well, again, the other goes over, so it's wheat in terms of rice. So, uh, and I'll just show this to you. Wheat in country B is 200, rice is 100. So it's 200 divided by 100. So it's 200 divided by 100 equals 2. So the answer 
Uh, the opportunity cost of rice in country B equals two kilograms of wheat. Now, looking at your answers, you should be able to see there. Sorry, I just hope you can see that. I hope you can see that. I apologize. Um, looking at your answers, you should be able to see which has an opportunity or which has at a comparative advantage, the lower opportunity cost. So country B holds the comparative advantage in wheat. We've already said that. And country A holds the comparative advantage in rice. If one country has a comparative advantage in the production of one good, then the other country mathematically must have the comparative advantage in the production of the other good. Now, so what we're asked to do now is to... Um, um, draw the diagram. Okay, now let's have a look back here. Country B can produce more uh, wheat. Country B can produce more rice. Therefore, country B has an absolute advantage in both. Right? But country B obviously has a comparative advantage in wheat and country A has a comparative advantage in rice. So country B should be further out on the wheat axis compared to, it, the, compared to how far it is on the rice axis. Okay, so I'm actually gonna, gonna keep this here. Okay, and I'm gonna, uh, you keep an eye on the, uh, on the figures. Okay, so this is rice. So we've got country A 80 and then 100. So we're 80. And then 100. And then we've got 100 and we've got 200. Okay, and this is country A. A, and this is country B. Okay, fantastic. I hope that makes sense. I really, really do. Um, if not, there's not much else I can do to explain it, so you're going to have to watch other videos. Now, with reference to the diagram in part C and or the data given, explain the theory of comparative advantage. Well, the theory states that a country should specialise in the production of those goods that can be produced at a lower opportunity cost. The data shows that country B has the comparative advantage in wheat as its opportunity cost is lower, half a kilogram of rice, than the opportunity cost of wheat in country A, 0.8. So country B should specialise in the production of wheat and country A should specialise, or uh, uh, country A has a comparative advantage in rice and as should, such should specialise in that. Okay. Now, the next thing that we're looking at here, and I hope this is really starting to get relatively simple, like, or at least, you know, you're starting to see this repeat. Okay, so the above diagram, blah, blah, blah. State the monthly volume of domestic production before the subsidy is granted. So it's obviously going to be a subsidy of $2 a kilogram. Okay, now this really annoyed me because... Excuse me again, because the diagram is just so difficult and my eyes aren't very good and I was just like straining to see this. So that's the amount that's produced domestically, which is 100,000 kilograms, 100,000 kg. Okay, that's the first thing. Um, yeah, I'm on this one. Okay, now. State the monthly value of imports before the subsidy is granted. So these are all, I know they're only one mark questions, but still, like, they're, they're, they're easy ones. As long as you can see the flipping diagram. Okay, so it's 600,000 minus 100,000, which is, excuse me, 500,000. Okay. So it's 600,000. Yeah. 600. Thousand minus five hundred thousand, and oh, sorry, 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 minus one hundred thousand. The answer equals five hundred thousand kilogram. Okay. Now calculate the level. So on the diagram, draw the new supply curve, right? And we're down by two. Isn't that right? Yes, five to three. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've got a cheeky one here, right? Because this is five, so we're we're down by two, and then we have to find. And this is what I just found, honestly, so difficult when I was looking at this because I just found it so difficult to kind of see something. Now I think here probably, but like, I mean, where, what what's this? Like? 
No, I'm not going to use that one. Yeah, that might work. Okay. Here. And now I have to go down, like from here, which is 13, 12, 11. This is why I didn't like it. It was too fine. Okay. And it's going to look something, taking my time. Something like that, which is S plus S plus S, as we were told to um, denote it in the question. Okay. H I J K. Okay, right. Um, so uh, we've done that. Now calculate the level of government spending required to finance this. Right. Well, you see, the thing is, what's the new domestic production now? And the new domestic production now seems to be. 300. So what this means now is that they are going to spend $2 for every good that's produced and there's 100,000, there's 300,000 produced so the cost of the government is 600,000. Okay, then it says what's the revenue? Okay, so calculate the revenue earned by domestic producers of butter before the subsidy is granted, okay? Well, before the subsidy is granted, they were receiving $6 and they were producing 100,000. So, what we're gonna say now is it's just 100,000 by six equals 600,000. Okay, very good. L, M, N, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure, right. Now, the next one, okay, is um, calculate the revenue earned by domestic producers of butter after the subsidy is granted. Okay, so what we have is equals 300,000, because that's the amount that they're producing, multiplied by the price, which is 6, plus 2, which is the subsidy. So equals 300,000 multiplied by 8, which equals 2 million... 400,000. Okay, now the next question reads, um, using your answers to party and or knowledge of economics, explain two disadvantages to Gondoa of the introduction of a subsidy on butter. So this is 6-0. Okay, so this in general is just the disadvantages of the introduction of a subsidy. Okay, so a subsidy must be financed by government spending. Okay, 600,000 in this case. The, there will be, there will thus be an opportunity cost involved. Okay, just want to see. Yeah. Okay. There will thus be an opportunity cost involved. Potential retaliation. So a subsidy to domestic firms may be seen as protection. This may give rise to retaliation from trading partners. Okay. Another um, disadvantage of a subsidy is global inefficiency. A subsidy will distort the pattern of trade, allowing relatively inefficient domestic producers to survive in the face of more efficient foreign competition. Thus, gains from comparative advantage will be lost, leading to reduced efficiency. Uh, the World Trade Organization sanctions. A subsidy to domestic firms may be seen as protection. And it is. That's exactly what it is. And this may give rise to sanctions from the World Trade Organization. And that certainly is true. Okay? So that's 6-0. Or 6 Now I think I'm right to move on to the next question. And now we're on to 7. Okay, we're nearly there, guys, an hour and 20 minutes. So the following diagram illustrates the market for corn in country A, where the price of corn is initially at the world price of 670 per kilogram, uh, and a portion of the country's corn requirements are met through imports. The government of country A decides to impose a tariff on imported corn. The effects are shown on the diagram. Okay, fantastic. So what we've got here is this. So determine the following, the size of the tariff per kilogram. Right, now this just really annoyed me, because... It's so difficult to see. So I think this is six, all right? Uh, or sorry, but this is the price here, which I think is like six, I don't know what that is, 70, okay? And then you go up one, two, three, four, five, and that's 720, okay? So the idea is that the, the, the answer to that is um, 50 cent per kilogram. And again, I just found it so difficult to read the, um, the um, what you call it, the, uh, the, the, the graph, the paper, the, 
the diagram. Okay, so determine the following. The increase in domestic production per year resulting from the tariff. Okay, well that's not too hard at all because after the tariff, before the tariff we were um, producing 110. After the tariff we're producing 200. So basically what that is, is 200,000 minus, or it's not 1,000 actually, it's million, isn't it? I forgot to forget. 200 minus 110. Okay, and that equals 90 million kg. Okay, determine the following, the decrease in domestic consumption per year resulting from the tariff. Right? Well, that's easy enough again. So it's 360 minus 280. Okay, so what we've got is 280 minus 360. Okay, and then the answer equals minus 80 million kg okay then the tariff revenue well what the tariff revenue is the tariff times the imports so we are importing now 280 times 200 and it's a 50 cent per kilo tariff okay so it's 0 0.5 dollars multiplied by 80 million um, and that equals 400 million dollars okay now the next one lists two other barriers to enter your trade barriers well we've got quotas subsidies to domestic producers administrative barriers and foreign exchange controls okay now that's good we're on to this one all right so keep that like that okay Calculate the change in revenue earned by domestic corn producers following the tariff. Well, what they were or earning um, is this amount, which I think is 670 times 110, and now they're earning 720 and it's 200. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's the revenue there. So it's 670 times 110 equals 737. And then 720 times 200 is 1440. So the change in producer surplus, or not in producer surplus in revenue, is 1440 minus 737 equals 703. Okay, so the answer equals 703 what? Million dollars. Okay, now the next one, which I don't know why we're kind of doing this, but anyway, they, they sometimes like a bit of um, percentages. Um, the next one is using your answer to whatever, calculate the percentage change in revenue of domestic corn producers. Right, well, what the percentage change is, okay, it's all over what we started from, which is 737. Um, but it's a change, so it's 1440, it's a new one minus the old multiplied by 100 over 1, which is 1440 minus 737 is 703 over 737 times 100 over 1. Okay, so that's 70300 over 737 equals 95.386. So therefore the answer equals 95.39%, not a bad return if you can get it. Okay, so then the next question asks, calculate the change in revenue earned by foreign corn producers because of the tariff. All right, well, the initial revenue, and I'll go back to the diagram, the initial revenue that they were earning, all right, was uh, here, 360 minus 110 times 670. So 360 minus 110 times 670 equals that. After the tariff now, they're earning 280, right, minus 200, but still times 670, because they don't get to keep that 50 cent extra, all right, keep that in mind. So it's 280 minus 200 times 670 equals 573, or 536, excuse me, 536. So the change in producer revenue equals foreign producer now, 536 minus 1675 equals minus one one three nine okay so the answer therefore equals minus and it's in dollars and it's a huge amount one million one oh, i don't know what it is is that a billion is it my god one three nine 
One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow. Okay, so over a billion dollars change. It's a lot of money. Okay, we see the FGHI. Okay, so I'm on this one now. So, next one is using your answer to a previous question, don't worry. Calculate the percentage change. Mm, I hate it when I do that. Calculate the percentage change um, um, in revenue earned by foreign corn producers. So, it's the old minus the new. Or it's the, yeah, it's the new minus the old. Sorry, the new minus the old. It's always new minus old. Okay. Um, six, seven, five. All over 1675 times 100 over 1 equals minus 1139. 1675 times 100 over 1, which equals minus 1139. Uh, zero, 0, and I did it again, didn't I? Yeah, I did. Okay. Over 1675 equals minus 68 percent okay now state one reason why governments may decide to impose a tariff to assist domestic producers to maintain level of employment to collect revenue to correct a deficit of trade and goods and services they're the reasons now, the last one 7k and just gone over one hour 30 minutes um, disadvantages of trade protection. There are many. I just went with two. Okay, higher prices for domestic consumers. The main gain from free trade is that consumers are able to buy goods and services at a lower price than the domestic one, than the domestic price. Uh, with trade protection, consumers are no longer able to buy imported goods at the world lower price, meaning that they have to pay higher prices than they otherwise would have and the misallocation of resources. When international trade takes place freely, uh, countries that are best at producing certain goods and services produce them, leading to greater world efficiency. With trade protection, inefficient domestic producers use society's scarce resources, which they otherwise wouldn't, leading to a misallocation of resources. Okay, and what else do we have? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, K, L. Okay, we're almost there, guys. Really good job. Okay. Um, now, um, calculate the decrease in consumer surplus resulting from the imposition of a tariff. Okay, right. Well, what we've got to do now, 9, okay, minus 720. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, have a look. Okay, so the new one is, uh, and it's the decrease, right? Yeah, so the new one is this this area here that's the new one so i'm going to say that's nine minus what is that 7.2 yeah uh times 280 okay sorry i i, I, I could see i wasn't sure so it's nine minus 7.2 um times 280 and it's a half that nine as well okay so um 0 0.5 five times nine minus 7.2 times 280, okay, which is 0 0.5 times 1.8 times 280, which is 0 0.9 times 280 times, which is 252, okay, uh, and that's obviously in dollars and so I think it's in millions as well. Okay, and now for the other one, okay, what we had is um, 9, minus 6.7, and it's half of that, of course, all the way out to 360. Okay, apologies, guys, I was interrupted there. So um, now I think I'm working out the other um, uh, consumer surplus, which is the old one. So it's 9 down to 670 and all the way to 360, okay? so But don't forget, the half has to be there as well. So... 0 0.5 times 9 minus 670 times 360, okay, which is uh, 0 0.5 times 2.3 times 360, okay, which is 1.15 times 360, which is 414. 
and again I think that's million as well okay so the idea is that it's the new minus the old all the time all the time all the time so it's 252 minus 414 equals minus 162 and what we're saying is the answer equals minus 162 million okay now last bit and we are finished okay explain why the welfare loss resulting from the corn tariff is smaller than the loss of consumer surplus now you really should know this the reason is i know the consumers lose a lot that's true and there is a deadweight loss but some of it is received by producer surplus and some of it is received by the government in terms of tax revenue which can go back into society not necessarily but it can so the welfare loss will be smaller than the loss of consumer surplus because producer surplus increases and the government earns tariff revenue those two reasons those two reasons producer surplus takes some of it and the government earns tariff uh, revenue I'll just see if I can okay um, and therefore part of the loss of consumer surplus is offset by a benefit to other stakeholders ie in this case domestic producers and the government guys we are one hour and 35 minutes thank you so so much for everything very good